discourse we chanted just now, setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. It starts with the whole Noble Eightfold Path as its topic, and then goes into right view. And that's all it discusses in detail, is right view. Going through the Four Noble Truths. It's interesting that simply listening to the talk on right view, one of the five brethren had his first taste of the deathless, or as I said, he experienced the opening of the Dhamma eye. And so right view is important. There's one analysis of the path that says with every factor of the path there are three qualities that circle around. The practice from one is right view, the second is right effort, the third is right mindfulness. And so as we practice, try to make sure that these three things are circling around you, circling around your practice right now. There are basically four truths covered by right view. First is a the truth of suffering and stress, dukkha is the Pali term. Sometimes we're told that the first truth is that life is suffering or everything is suffering. That's not the case. The Buddha said basically there is suffering. It's one of four things you're going to encounter. And you might be able to argue with the idea that life is suffering, but you can't argue with the idea that there is suffering. You see it all around. You see it all inside you. And what you do with suffering is to, you have to learn how to comprehend it, which means being in a position where you can watch it, see how it comes, see how it goes, and see what comes and goes along with it. That's essentially what the word samudhi in it translated as cause or origination means. You want to see that every time that there's real suffering in the mind, there's an element of craving, three kinds of craving to be specific. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. Craving for sensuality is easy enough to explain. The desire to have sensual pleasures. The desire to have desires. That's one of the most interesting parts of the analysis, that our sensuality is not so much the things out there that we're attached to. We're more attached to our plans for things out there, our scheming for things out there, for pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. We spend a lot more time planning and working toward these things than we actually do in tasting them. Many times the taste is very fleeting. Think about the food that we eat. Exactly how long does it really taste good in your mouth? Think about that little burst of taste. Think of how much work goes into preparing the food, getting the food cleaning up after the meal. Of course, we do it for more than just the taste. We do it to keep the, the body going. But there's an awful lot of energy expended in the idea of, let's make this taste really good. And it goes, goes, goes. We're actually more attached to our plans for these things, our desires for these things than we are to the things themselves, because it's easy enough to replace a desire for one thing with a desire for something else. It's hard to just drop desire entirely. That's one of the causes of suffering. The other is craving for becoming. You want to become something within a particular world. We choose our worlds, you know.
the context in which we see ourselves, the context in which we move and exert an influence. These two things are entwined, both the world in which we have a self and the self itself. Sometimes it's on the sensual level, sometimes it's on the level of form, as when we're sitting and meditating, just sort of being inside the form of the body. Sometimes it's on the formless level, any abstraction, anything without a form. And again, we tend to go from one of these types of becoming to another, to another, to another. This is what the the wandering on is all about. We go from that's what Baba is in the wandering. These are the places we go to and go from. These are the locations that the mind focuses on. And we suffer because of this, because none of these locations can last. None of these positions can last. Whatever we latch on to as a self, it just keeps melting away. The world around us just keeps melting away. And there's finally craving for non-becoming, the desire to destroy whatever you've got, whatever you identify yourself with, or to destroy the world around you. If it's unpleasant, you don't like it, you want to just get rid of it which can either be an external destructive urge or an internal destructive urge. Paradoxically, that's called a type of craving that leads to becoming as well. Why is that? Because in taking on the identity of a destroyer, you're assuming another identity. In taking delight in the idea of destruction, you're watering a sense of identity or watering a sense of being. That's in the image of a seed planted in the ground. The seed is your consciousness, the ground is all your past karma. That is manifesting right now. And then there's the delight in doing something with it, either creating something out of it or destroying it. All of that counts as a cause of suffering. It may sound pretty abstract, but as you get to know the mind, you begin to sense the movement as it's going in one of these directions or another. And it sounds like we're in a double bind. The desire to get rid of becoming itself is a way of creating becoming. And this is where the Buddha's genius as a strategist comes in. He says, you. Go beyond becoming not by destroying, but becoming, but by learning how to create new forms of becoming that are more skillful, particularly the becoming of concentration, getting the mind to settle down and be in one spot. As long as you're going to have a location, have it a solid, steady location. Because one, it's one of the more comfortable ways you can give rise to happiness. It's a blameless way of giving rise to happiness. Sometimes you hear about the dangers of being stuck on concentration. You look through the texts, and the Buddha talks about them only in very rare cases. In other words, you delight in the state of equanimity, or you get in one of these states and you really don't want to get beyond it. But that's pretty harmless, pretty minor compared to the the danger of staying stuck in sensuality. You have long, long suttas talking about all the suffering that comes, all the conflict that comes from sensual craving. You have to work hard, and sometimes the things you gain from working hard get destroyed. Or even when you do gain these things, they don't really stay with you. As the Buddha says, sometimes fire burns it, water washes it away. Thieves or kings will make off with it. I like that, pairing thing, thieves with kings. Or hateful heirs make off with it. And it's because of sensual craving that there are conflicts within the family, conflicts among nations. 
This is why we go to war. I don't think anyone has ever gone to war over attachment to jhana, attachment to concentration. We kill, steal, have illicit sex, lie to each other, indulge in intoxicants, all because of sensual craving, sensual attachment, none of which happens because of our attachment to jhana. So jhana is a relatively blameless form of happiness. So it gives us nourishment on the path. At the same time, it's it's a very transparent form of becoming, because we have to watch ourselves doing it, because we have to do it so carefully. This is where the mindfulness comes in. There's one of the definitions in the canon of mindfulness is being very meticulous. The more meticulous you are, the better you remember things. And you need that kind of quality, being very meticulous, keeping something in mind in order to maintain your concentration. This is one of the functions of right mindfulness. It's not only to enter into skillful mental states, but also to keep remembering how to stay there. And if you're meticulous in doing it, you begin to see more clearly exactly what's involved in getting the mind to settle down. This is why I say it's a transparent form of becoming, because as you watch it, you begin to understand what becoming is all about. You can begin to identify which part of the, the practice is based on old karma, which part of it is based on your present consciousness and all the other things that go along with that, and which part of it is watered by the sense of delight. So the trick there is once you learn how to do this, then, as the Buddha said, you learn how to see things simply as they've come to be. In other words, just look at what is this past karma that's being offered up to you right now. Our instinctive reaction always is to make something out of it. Because you watch it simply as it's come to, into being, without time trying to create something out of it, without trying to destroy it. Without even taking delight in the equanimity. That's the hard part. It's pretty easy to get down to the state of equanimity, equanimity just watching these things, but it takes a lot of insight to realize that equanimity itself is a kind of doing, it's a kind of creating something out of your experience, it's something that we delight in. So this goes deeper than just plain equanimity. The Buddha says you have to learn how not to make anything out of anything, even out of the jhana even out of your strong concentration. But when you can do that, okay, then you can break through to the deathless. So instead of just operating on the desire to get rid of things, we learn how to create something really skillful. This is the basic pattern of the Buddha's path. The fourth noble truth is to give rise to skillful states in the mind, so you can understand what it is to give rise to a state. And you get more sensitive to exactly what in the present moment is the given and what part is the added part. Because for the most part, we're very ignorant of what we're adding to things. Our normal experience of space and time is something that's already been added to. The aggregates come in kind of a potential form, and then we based on which things we're interested in, which things we want to create, which things we want to destroy, we actually create our experience of the present out of these different potentials. So we have to do a lot of digging down into the, our experience of the present moment to see, well, what's, what's just the potential without anything added at all, not even equanimity. This requires that we get the mind really still and really alert and really interested in what it's doing. This is how right view hovers around the meditation. Right effort and right mindfulness hover along with it, trying to give rise to what's skillful and abandon what's unskillful. That's the right effort. Being mindful to give rise to what's skillful, to abandon what's unskillful. And once you've entered into what's skillful, being mindful to stay with it. It's all very proactive. 
but it's transparently proactive. So this is why when you delve into right view, you begin to realize it covers the whole path. It's not just a matter of understanding something in an abstract way. It's learning how to see things in a new light and then act on what you're seeing in an appropriate way. So it's not just a theory, it's a guide to an action while we're sitting here, getting the minds to settle down and be still. And John Lee's images of having a chicken that lays eggs. You eat some of the eggs to keep yourself nourished, and you take the eggs apart to see what eggs are made of, what their parts are, or to watch how they develop. The analogy breaks down there, but ultimately you get to the point where you don't need the eggs anymore, either for the nourishment or for the, the study, for your investigation. That's when you put the path aside. Even right view gets put aside. But in the meantime, you want to make sure that it's always there hovering around your meditation to keep it on course and to make sure that what you're doing is transparent to you. That's how, that's, that's how the process of becoming in concentration leads to something that goes beyond becoming. Well, there's no suffering at all. And that, as the Buddha said, is the end of the problem.